Hi, everyone. Happy Constitution Day. Well, I guess tomorrow is actually Constitution Day, but we're celebrating it today because it's on a weekend this year. Um, welcome to our rule of all for rule of law for all teach in and especially to our um, live expert panel. Um, we're really happy that you joined us today and you're letting us into your classroom to help celebrate Constitution Day. We appreciate it. Um, I'm Kathy Ruffing. I um, taught in public high school in Virginia for 27 years, and now for the last four years, I've been with Street Law, and um, I have the distinct honor of moderating this expert panel. Um, and if all goes well, uh, hopefully you'll hear very little from me except to sort of move things along. Uh, we are recording today, just so you know. Um, so your questions may be read live and then um, answered and you can go back and hear that on recording or teachers who um, you know, wanna show this in another class, it will be available shortly after we finish today. Um, your teachers all let you know that it's really important to know the source of your information. So we're gonna start with a little bit about street law. Um, I'm not gonna read this to you cause it's on the screen, but I'll just say, um, emphasize that we are a non not nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. Um, and we really work very hard on that. And we're, our mission is to advance um, civic and law related education to try to further the rule of law and democracy, both in the United States and around the world. So that's a little bit about who we are. Um, today, also from Street Law, I have with me Ati Waldman. She'll um, turn her camera on and say a few words in just a second. Um, she is with the Teacher PD team. Ati? Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I, as Kathy said, work on the Teacher PD team and work to help young people uh, learn about civics and the rule of law, both here in the US and internationally. And we also have Ben Marsh with us today, who's gonna be on the tech side of things. Hi everyone, happy to be here. Um, Streelist Communications Coordinator, and as Kathy said, I'll be handling all things tech related today. I did just want to start out by thanking the Annenberg Public Policy Center at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, Street Law received a grant from them to write a whole curriculum about um, rule of law in the United States to help teachers teach about it. And um, they funded that important work and today's um, Constitution Day rule of law for all teach in, including this expert panel. So thank you to the Annenberg Center. Before we jump in, I did want to let you know how you can participate in today's um, expert panel. So teachers, probably the easiest thing for you to do would be to submit questions through the Zoom Q&A. So if you want to have students hand you um, questions on pieces of paper or text you questions or whatever, um, that would be most useful for teachers who um, have the link to this um, to this webinar. Um, and for students, you can text your questions to 240-863-2406. Um, and if you wanna take a picture of that or teachers, if you wanna write that um, number on the board, the slide's gonna go away very shortly. Um, so you might wanna capture that number. Um, I want to make an important note, and that's that our panelists are um, in very sensitive positions, and they may need to decline an answer um, to some questions if their positions require them to do so. So we have um, advocates and judges um, who are sitting on cases at the moment, which may not allow them to do that. Um, so just be respectful if a, a if an panelist can, has to decline, um, know that they're doing so not because they're dodging your question, but because um, there may they might have some restrictions that don't allow them to give their opinion currently on a question. Okay, I'm going to move on from that number. So make sure you capture it um, if you need to.
Okay, before we begin our panel, let's take a look at a basic definition of the rule of law. So like everything, if you Google rule of law, you're going to find hundreds of different definitions of it. This is our definition at street law. We tried to bring, really bring it back down to a really um, understandable level for students. So we're going to use this definition. Um, rule of law is the principle that everyone must obey the law that it requires that laws are fair and applied equally to everyone so that no one is above the law. Um, it's a pretty simple definition and that's one of the reasons we're having an hour long um, expert panel so we can really dig in to what does that mean and we can hear from people um, with lots of different experiences what it means to them. So a lot of times we ask students when we're defining something to think about what something would look like. How would you know it if you saw it, right? So we came up with six key factors. So if you looked at a society, how would you know that the rule of law was strong there? And these are the six key factors that we identified. Just as a little background for you, so you can be thinking about this. And again, you can capture this by taking a picture of it or um, this lives on our website. Um, so you can always teachers find it later. We actually even have a poster of it that you can get. So governments are powers are limited. There is peace and stability in this society. The government is open and transparent. There is no corruption. Fundamental rights are protected and the court system is effective and fair. So if you saw a society that had um, perfect rule of law, which spoiler alert doesn't exist, um, you would see all of these things to their fullest. Okay, um, so now I'm gonna introduce the panelists. I'm gonna stop sharing. Uh, and I'm going to introduce the panelists very briefly. And after I introduce them, I'm going to invite them to say a couple words about how their work connects to the rule of law. Um, so we're going to start with Scott Carlson. Scott Carlson is Associate Executive Director of the American Bar Association Center for Global Programs. And the American Bar Association is um, the biggest organization of lawyers. So that's who the American Bar Association is. They're not bartenders. Um, over the course of his career, he served as a senior rule of law advisor for, at the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement and a senior rule of law advisor at the Rule of Law Center for Innovation at the U.S. Institute of Peace. So Scott, I'll let you tell us a little bit about how that um, work connects to the rule of law. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, so the American Bar Association's Rule of Law Initiative started about a little over 30 years ago. When the uh, Berlin Wall came down, the ABA recognized that there was uh, a relatively unique moment in world history, which required a unique response. So the ABA organized pro bono, that means volunteer uh, lawyers to go overseas and support the former Soviet bloc as it transitioned from a totalitarian state into a, 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 a collection of democratic ones. Um, to date, the American Bar Association has provided over $300 million in pro bono assistance. That's the equivalent if that had been paid for by those volunteers. I was one of those volunteers uh, myself. In 1994, I went to the Republic of Albania where I volunteered for a year and I served as a rule of law liaison at the high court in Albania. As you might imagine, you know, this experience changed my life as a young attorney, and I went on to devote my legal career really to promoting rule of law around the world. Now I'm the chief executive officer here at the Rule of Law Initiative, and we currently implement over 90 international programs in 40 different countries, and we have a, an annual budget of approximately $47 million in turnover a year. So that gives you a sense of uh, what my current role is and how I found my, how I, my journey to this position. Thank you. Great, thank you. Our next panelist is Judge Zia Faruqi. He is a federal magistrate judge for the District of Columbia. Prior to his appointment, he was a federal prosecutor in the United States Attorney's Office. He has prosecuted numerous criminal crimes, including crimes involving terrorist use of cryptocurrency, nuclear weapons proliferation, darknet sites dedicated to child 
exploitation and antiqu antiquities theft. He also hosts a podcast called Grab the Gavel, which I hope he'll tell us more about at some point today. <clears throat> Thanks so much for the uh, introduction. Uh, excited to be here. Always happy to promote uh, the podcast. It is part of the uh, Rendell Center for Civics and Civics Engagement. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, like many people, are concerned about, um, you know, Constitution Day is just once a year. It's the Christmas of civics holidays. I'm sure hopefully there's as much celebration in your households uh, as in ours. The civics tree is up and uh, civic Santa Claus better bring you all gifts. Uh, so if you've been nice and studied your civics, so you know it, it's um, it's a one day a year type of thing, and even that I don't think enough people know about it. I, I candidly I didn't know about it until I learned of it through the court. Even though I was a federal prosecutor uh, and a lawyer, I uh, was unaware of this event. You know, sort of special day of the year. But the Rendell Center, uh, you know, Judge Rendell is a Third Circuit judge. And she's in a circuit court. It's above the district court, one below the Supreme Court. Uh, she is really concerned that schools have reduced civic education, um, but more importantly, they've reduced uh, access to resources for teachers. And so uh, I felt that, you know, after uh, on January 6th, I'm here in Washington, D.C., a lot of those cases, most of them go through our courthouse. I think a lot of people felt like um, we just weren't sure what was occurring in our country and what people, if they understood what was going on in terms of our democratic processes. And so I took the opportunity, uh, you know, right around then, I'd already been communicating uh, with the Rendell Center, but that really this was a chance to focus on what, you know, a uh, former CIA director, two Supreme Court justices, Justices Gorsuch and, and Justice Sotomayor called the, one of the greatest national security threats, which is a lack of civic education. So I just want to play my part however I can. I never thought I would be here. Certainly I was never the best student. Uh, so don't, um, don't learn from my, um, don't do as I do, but learn from my state, my mistakes. Uh, but I was really, someone who's been very lucky and had a lot of opportunities and it's allowed me to uh, get to be where I am today. And I just want to use it to try to help uh, lift other people up. So thanks for having me here today. Great, thank you. Our next panelist is Faye lopez Getkey. She's the Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at the Law School Admissions Council. Prior to joining LSAC, she was Executive Director of the Seattle Community Police Commission where she engaged in uh, with minoritized communities to help drive police and practice changes to improve or policy and practice changes to improve police impact on marginalized communities. Hi, um, welcome. This is very cool. I wish when I was in high school or middle school that that there's a presentation like this. Um, so I my pronouns are she, her, and ella. Uh, and I want to talk to you a little bit about the Law School Admission Council. Um, so what the council does is it administers, it creates and administers the law school admission test, um, also known as the LSAT. The LSAT is designed to assess the critical reasoning, reading comprehension, and persuasive writing skills that are critical to success in law school. The way the LSAT was created was back when um, the, the uh, veterans benefits. So part of being a veteran in, in the mili US military is to get benefits to go to school. Um, oftentimes college, higher education, college and graduate school was closed off to so many communities if you didn't have the money to pay. And so through the VA, the, this new benefit um, uh, came along and a lot of people, well, particularly men, I will just say, um, were able to utilize that benefit to go to, to go to school. And so what the law school saw was, you know, what, what would happen to get into law school is you needed, you needed money and you needed uh, influence, right? So it was a lot of rather affluent, rich um, uh, white men primarily going to law school. So what law schools did, because there was an uptick of folks who could now go to school, now afford to attend is that they said we need a more equitable way to review these applicants so that we can get more more folks into the profession. So um, the law school admission test was specifically designed to help level the playing field. Um, so that was the original intent of the LSAT admission test. Um, and so we know 
right, at the LSEC that we are a critical factor. We're not the only factor, but we are a critical, the LSAT is a critical factor that law schools look at um, to think about who they're going to admit into law schools. But the LSEC does so much more. Uh, we also invest, because we know of our power in this space, um, to impact our ability to diversify the legal profession. We also invest our time and money into diversifying the legal profession through granting money to organizations that help students like you. We actually do grant money to street law uh, to get into law school. We also provide free LSAT prep. Uh, through our partnership with Khan Academy. Some of you may be using Khan Academy right now. Um, we also provide opportunities for students to meet with law schools, both in person and virtually through our LSAC forums um, that we host nationwide. There is so much we offer to aspiring lawyers to help, to help you get into law school. I'm gonna insert a link um, into the chat to provide you with a sample of some of that support we provide for aspiring lawyers like potentially you, but please feel free to look through our website to find other sources. And again, you probably can access any one of us uh, as well if you have more questions. Thank you. Great. And um, our last but not least panelist is Colleen Sinzak. She is an assistant to the Solicitor General of the United States at the Department of Justice. In that role, she briefs and argues cases before the Supreme Court. Colleen served as a law um, clerk at the Supreme Court for Chief Justice John Roberts and at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit for then Judge, now Attorney General Merrick Garland. Um, she was also, most importantly, a high school English teacher. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Colleen. Hello, um, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, so I am now an assistant to the Solicitor General. That means that sometimes I argue before the Supreme Court on behalf of the United States, but a lot of my job is also deciding what um, positions the United States should take when it goes before the Supreme Court. And I think that is where the rule of law is absolutely essential because uh, to, to my work, because we're trying to represent the government's interest, but one of the government's most important interests and, and maybe the most important interest is in protecting the rule of law. So we want to be um, uh, asking the court to say that the law means the same thing in every case. We don't wanna say, oh, the law means this in this case, because it'll help us win. And then next time we're gonna say the law means something totally different, because that way we'll win in that case. Rather, we wanna be saying, this is what the law means. And even if it's not gonna help us as much as we'd like it to in this case, that's what we want you to hold, because we believe in the rule of law. Great, thank you. So I have to say, when I was imagining this panel, when we first started to think about this, my goal was to have a federal judge check, um, someone from the Department of Justice Attorney General's office check, and then professionals who work in the legal profession and with attorneys who are working in areas that deal with the rule of law, check, check. So I was very excited. Um, and my last wish for this panelist was a student moderator. So now it is um, my great honor to introduce you to Mac Embo. She is a junior at Patriot High School in Prince William County, Virginia, and um, she came to us from Ms. Uh, Randy Warren, who teaches a law class there. So I'm going to throw it over to Mac to say, to introduce herself and to answer the very first question of our panel. So go ahead and introduce yourself, Mac, and then I'll throw you a question. Hi, my name is Mac. I am a junior at Patriot High School. I'm in theater. I'm in an AP Lit class. I'm planning to take intro to law next year. And for me, the rule of law is saying that no one is above the law. The law will be the same for everyone, which means it will protect people who aren't sure that they're gonna win or lose because they'll know the law will be the same and it's not gonna change and it won't make people uncertain. Great, so she went ahead and answered the first question, which is fantastic. So we're gonna throw that question, that same question, which is um, what does the rule of law mean to you? And um, why is it important to our democracy? I think those things probably go together. And we're gonna start this round with Judge Faruqi. 
I feel like Judge Mack already, I, I could just, <clears throat> as uh, Colleen knows, when you're a, an appellate judge, so there's like multiple judges on there. So I'm at the district court level, there's just one, which is great because there's no one to tell us we're wrong, maybe, um, except for the smart people who are upstairs, like uh, when Judge Garland was there. But uh, when you hear some, one of your, when you're a circuit court and when you, you've got, you've got teamwork, right? You've got um, someone to help you with. So I think Judge Mack really nailed it on there, but I'm going to try to do my best to add a little bit of extra flavor. Uh, I think she's just absolutely right about what the most important thing to me in terms of the rule of law is that idea of access to justice. And the thing that most concerned me, you know, Rebecca Fanning is on this call. She's there in the background. Uh, she always is. She represents um, my organization, the agency, the United States uh, Office of the Courts, the administrative office. She is the person who works with teachers, uh, judges, uh, lawyers throughout the country to make sure people uh, feel like they have access to the courts and understand what the courts do. And I'm most concerned is that when Rebecca brings me into classrooms like this virtually or in person, is that I hear students who say the same thing I thought when I was in school, which is that I don't look like somebody who is a judge. I don't have the money to have the access that people have to courts. Uh, and my community is one that feels marginalized. And so a lot of times um, I don't think courts care about me. And uh, that's certainly how I felt. And I'm so worried now to be on this other side uh, of it that uh, those were the ways that I felt because I don't think it's true. I think Judge Mack is right. Um, is that it is about everyone being treated equally. And that means that you are lifting people up, uh, which was what I was thinking. I thought I was at a deficit because I didn't have uh, certain things in my background and my heritage. My parents immigrated to the United States. Uh, my mom still doesn't understand what I do. Uh, she gets confused about which court or why when there's a legal decision she sees on the news. What way was I at fault or could I have not made it better? And so, um, so I still am always, there's always room to improve with my mom. Uh, but uh, you know, this was all pretty foreign, literally, to my family. And so uh, I think it's important that judges, and not just the judges, right? It's the people in the entire courthouse. It's the law clerks. Uh, you just heard that Colleen was a law clerk. It's very much them. I think they're a judge's conscience. It's my courtroom deputy. It's, she, it's her courtroom. She keeps me on point and keeps things going. All of us work together so that people might feel like that they are starting from behind the start line, that they are treated equally. But also some people come into court, and they're really fancy in Washington, D.C., and they think that this is, they, they built this courthouse, you know, their grandparent may have been a president, their uncle may have been a senator, and they're treated just like everybody else. And I think that's really important. So people see what equity uh, under the eyes of the law means. Equality is, is, we're all treated equally, and that's, everyone is treated with compassion and kindness. It's not that we are trying to tear people down or bring them up. Everyone is supposed to be treated, particularly in criminal cases, as a presumed innocent person. I always say, the difference between me and the person who's there on the other side is that I got more chances and I could have easily been there. And so I just want to be treated like if it were me in those other shoes. And so that means treated fairly and compassionately. And so to me, the rule of law means not just that, uh, that sense, like Max said, of um, equal access to law, equal treatment, but also that people are treated with compassion. me right I just want to make sure <laughs> um, as it, it you know it's important to be fair and to be treated fairly right you know so it's not about the ultimate law that's in place but the process itself needs to be feel like it's fair um, but we only have the limited experience of our family our friends and the places we know to help guide us in what is fair it would be impossible to know what someone else sees, feels, or experiences. The, the, the law helps us to outline what is needed uh, to be fair. But because laws, for the most part, are written, interpreted, and defended by people, um, mostly lawyers, judges, politicians, it's important that we have people coming from different backgrounds and experiences who can in, who can be included, who, their, where their perspectives can be included and in how those laws um, impact them and their communities or whether laws need to even be there or be created to protect, right? Um, and to understand and wield the law is powerful because laws impact everything we do, everything that's around us from 
food, to your house, to your living, to your school, to driving, to your health. Um, it, 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 every single thing you have no idea is impacted by some law um, uh, or some policy. So those who can wield it, those who can understand it are powerful. And we've seen whole communities drive change, right? Drive the law to change. But that means nothing if you don't have those that are in power who are impacting and who are writing these things and who can see those changes be involved. Um, so we need to ensure that we have representation in the law, right? And in every place um, to ensure that we understand the impacts um, and be open to that. Otherwise, the rule of law can feel meaningless to us and we may not want to follow those laws or, uh, 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 or acknowledge them. Sometimes we don't even know they exist. Most of the time, we don't know that they exist to be perfectly honest, but, but it's still very powerful in our lives. Thank you. Hello, I think it's me. Um, uh, so for, for me, um, the rule of law uh, is really about um, the people in power doing uh, governing according to what the law says and not according to their personal preferences. So nowadays, the people that I deal with um, in power are usually you know, the president or the Congress or a Supreme Court. But when I was a teacher, the people in power were often the teachers and the principals. And, you know, I think that when I was a teacher, I thought of kind of the rule of law in, in, in three main ways. And I, I still think about it that way um, today in, in court. And that's um, that, first of all, uh, the rule of law means that the people in power apply the law to everyone equally. They don't uh, make the law like create exceptions for people that they like or do not like. So if the law in your school is there's no cell phones in class and your teacher sees, you know, Jane Smith, her favorite student with a cell phone out, she's going to punish that that student, even though she loves Jane Smith. Um, so, I, and, you know, similarly, if the, the president's best friend is, uh, you know, stealing things, um, stealing cars, he has to go to jail. The president doesn't say, eh, maybe not, because I like this guy. Um, and I also think that the rule of law means that the person in power has to apply the law uh, in every circumstance, even if they don't like the way it comes out. So again, if the rule in your school is no cell phones in class and your teacher's really tired and it's Friday afternoon and she just wants to let the kids play on their cell phones for the next hour, she's not gonna do that under the rule of law, right? She's gonna say, no, we do not have cell phones even though it would make my life easier in this case. Um, and again, you know, if the, the president comes on upon a law and says, wow, I really wish I could just kind of ignore Congress in this instance, because like Congress is not doing what I want them to be doing. But the rule of law says, no, the president has to, um, has to respect Congress's authority, even when he thinks that Congress is maybe not making the decisions he wants it to be, it, it to make. Um, and then the third thing, which I think is really important is that the person in authority follows the law his or hers, herself. So um, if you're a teacher and there's no cell phones in class, you can't be texting your best friend because your teacher, your student just said something hilarious. And if you're the president of the United States, you have to obey the laws. You're not allowed to lie. You can't decide, well, in this instance, if I just, you know, lie under oath a little bit, like maybe that would be fine. I'm the president, I'm super powerful. No, the law applies to you in the same way. So I, th I think I'm up next. Um, so originally I was thinking about sharing with all of you uh, a UN definition of rule of law, which is hyper-technical and uh, covers a lot of things that my colleagues said. But uh, on, in hindsight, I don't think that's necessary. What, what I'd like to talk about more so is why is rule of law so important? Uh, from my perspective, which is one that looks around the world. 
And these are some statistics up on the slide that you can see uh, from the Task Force on Justice, which is a group which we collaborate with in our space. And I think if you just look at the first big bullet, that two thirds of the 7.7 .7 billion people uh, on the planet lack meaningful equal access to justice, that should shock everyone. Um, admittedly, the United States has some uh, unique challenges uh, at the moment, particularly. But when you when you think about the fact that we still have a high degree of rule of law, and we have um, you know significant access to justice, and you think about the plight of the rest of the world, uh, I hope you can understand what is the motivation of myself and my colleagues who work on this project, uh, because. The consequences are quite grave, as you can see, by looking at the breakdown of what are some of the specific deficits that many people experience. And it's just, you know, I don't think you can overemphasize the importance of rule of law and ensuring that the, the wrongs that you see enumerated here on this slide get addressed. Um, I, for one, am not someone who's comfortable going to sleep at night and waking up the following day with the thought that this many people on the planet are really sort of disenfranchised from the liberties and freedoms that I enjoy. And so I think as long as uh, we have this amount of injustice or justice-free zones, you know, it's incumbent upon all of us as citizens of the planet to focus on this. And the, the last remark I'll make on this is that, because uh, I think my colleagues did a great job of de defining rule of law, I'll contrast rule by law. And rule by law should not be confused with rule of law. Um, because rule by law does not presume that there's really any of the safeguards on individual liberties and freedoms that my colleagues have talked about, nor any real system for protecting the independence of Congress or, or the courts uh, fr uh, from one another. And so, for example, you know, China has a very elaborate system of laws, but these laws do not necessarily recognize or comply with you know, international human rights standards, uh, separation of powers concepts, or, or even guarantee the sort of basic liberties and freedoms. And so I, I would caution everyone to distinguish rule by law with rule of law. Thanks. Okay, great. We're actually gonna, um, panelists, I started to type this to you, but I wasn't fast enough. We're actually gonna skip a prepared question because we're getting great Q and questions in the Q&A and over uh, text. So we're gonna jump to our prepared question of um, what can we, the adults and students on this call, do to further the rule of law? And we'll start with Faye this time and then do the same order. Um, but knowing that there are great questions, um, let's see if we can keep the answers brief so we can get to student questions. Um, it, well, my my particular answer had to do with my answer to the previous question. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. How do I see the rule of law in the U.S. just a little bit? So because it talks to what we can do together um, to further the rule of law. So the times change and so must our laws, right? Um, and racism, for example, has a long history in the United States and has shaped our laws and policies. The impact of those laws still to this day impact all of us. So think of the rule of law in our democracy like an old house built hundreds of years ago. Over the years, the house decayed. And in order to live in the house, you got to update it. If it didn't include plumbing, you put plumbing in. If you didn't have electricity, you add that too. Over time, the foundation starts to crumble, so you fix that. Hey, your, your family is growing over the generation, so you expand the house, right? Um, you, you utilize an asbestos, you know, in your installation, and we found that it, really, it kills people. And so we need to change the asbestos, right? We need to put better insulation that doesn't harm. Asbestos lives in the walls, and you can't see it, but it's been there for a long time. So, so you get the idea, right? Like, you know, we live in an old house that still has the structure and bones that need to be updated over time. 
our laws and utilizing the you know racism have racism embedded in the bones and like the asbestos that resides in the walls and can't be seen it does so much harm and needs to be removed we need to remove that racism that is also embedded in our legal structure and so what can we do to further the rule of law and really think about these things thoughtfully, critically, look at the asbestos in the walls? We must stand up and participate in the shaping and reshaping of those laws on behalf of our communities. As students, I have seen youth throughout the years, throughout the decades, move, you know, stand up, strike, you know, um, be part they participate. And um, we must educate ourselves, our families, our friends. In my opinion, it's harder to talk to our friends and our families about these hard issues to move this change than it is to march in a parade. It is to march on behalf of women's rights, on the behalf of LGBTQ plus rights, on behalf of you know whatever we're marching for. It is harder to have those conversations, to learn more from our colleagues, our friends, our teachers, our family, those interactions are actually the most powerful interactions. So learning more about what's going on and then being that ally, that warrior uh, for those who um, are impacted by the rule of law in negative ways, right? So um, that's how I would see that how we could further um, both as youth um, and throughout your life. Thank you. Yeah, I, I completely agree that part of ensuring the strength of the rule of law is to be sure that our laws are good laws. Um, you know, the rule of law assumes that the law applies equally to everyone, but if the law itself is is bad, um, if the law has, has a flaw for whatever reason, then applying that to everyone is going to make everyone suffer. So I think that's one thing is to, to look critically at laws and think about how we can change laws that are, are not good. Um, you know, the other thing, and again, I think this is what I encounter a lot in, in, in my job is to, um, to think beyond just like the, 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 the exact moment that you're dealing in and think more globally about, um, about, about, uh, about, for example, how a law is going to apply across the board. So I think that the, the rule of law suffers when we uh, think only about the exact moment we're in. You know, this, something seems really scary and bad. And so we just think, well, we'll just make an exception to this law to deal with this really scary, bad thing that we do not like. Um, but once you've made an exception to the law, it's much, it's really easy for the next person to make an exception to the law and the next person to make an exception and the next person. And um, some of those exceptions you're not going to like, uh, you know, if, if, because, because the person making the exception isn't going to share your values and isn't going to do that to, to think um, in the same way that you do. Uh, and, and so I think to, to me, it's very important to think about what laws are good and what laws are bad, but, it, but, but what we need to do when we encounter bad laws is to change them, not start saying we don't need to adhere to laws uh, in this situation. We have some exceptions because uh, I think that really does undermine the rule of law. Thanks. So I guess I go next. Is that right, Kathy? All right. So I think this is really the question for our times. First and foremost, I would recommend that everyone here on this call just question simplistic solutions. Uh, to governance problems. I mean, our system of government is not based on complexity for complexity's sake. You know, that's not to say, you know, a bunch of processes can't be simplified or improved, but we must all really take care to understand that certain processes are in place and they're protecting certain interests, uh, even if they are complex and time consuming. And second, I'd say we must all do our part to question those who seek to divide the country based on race, sex, ex ethnicity, sexual orientation, et cetera. You know, our constitutional republic is by definition ruled by the majority, but it's with respect for the rights of the constituent minorities. That's always been, you know, the ethos, and that's a feature, it's not a bug. And we really all need to stand forward and be vocal about that. And last, um, I think, but not least that in that similar vein, you, we can't assume other people are going to stand up for the rule of law for us. You know, we are the owners of this country and these systems. Um, 
each of us, I really think, has to challenge our peers and family and friends. You know, I'm reminded of an old quote. Uh, uh, Mrs. Powell asked uh, Benjamin Franklin in 1787, which is it, a republic or a mon monarchy? Uh, to which Ben Franklin replied, it's a republic if you can keep it. And I think right now we need to really all focus together uh, as a nation on keeping the republic. I want to make sure we get to the question. So I just be two quick things. I agree with everything everyone has said so far, uh, which is it's fun to hear really uh, such interesting and thoughtful answers that, I mean, I, I feel motivated, right? I hear, I feel motivated hearing everyone on this call telling me to step up my game. And so I'm going to try to do that. Uh, I want to say two quick things to add on to, onto that. One uh, is obviously when you look at me like that guy's too young to be a judge, right? And I'm just assuming everyone's nodding their heads very vigorously right now in their classrooms. Um, please don't uh, make me feel like I'm not. And so, uh, but one thing I do hear from sometimes from people, uh, I do have a lot of ideas of how things I want to do differently um, about some of the outreach or engagement or even the ways that maybe I view cases. And I feel like sometimes people are like, oh, um, you're naive uh, and or you, you, you just don't know. And I don't want you all as people who are young students, don't listen to that. Don't listen to people who tell you that you're too young to make a difference. Don't let people confuse naive with hopefulness. They're two different things. And why you are powerful is because you are hopeful. And it's unfortunate. One of the harder things about getting older is it's harder to stay hopeful because you see people and things happen to them. And you're like, how are we gonna do this? And you have a lot of challenges. You've heard Scott just mentioned a lot of them by name, things that are, acute problems right now in our world today. And so it's probably a lot harder for you to be hopeful than maybe it was for me because I didn't grow up with the internet and knowing how many troubles there were. So you see that, that it's out there, but I do believe that the solution will come from younger people because you have more imagination. You are more hopeful. You know how to address these new problems because you have been born into them when they're apparent. So just don't let people silence your voices because they say you're a high school student, you're a middle school student. I don't care what you are, you are powerful and you are an equal member of our community. And so your voice has to be heard and the people who tell you not to listen, not to be listened to, get, get away from them, get around people who wanna amplify and, and loud in your voices. The second thing I'll say is there are people who um, are very vulnerable uh, to in, in terms of the rule of law and need the greater assistance than others. You should help everyone that you can. But uh, one of the things that we're doing in our courthouse I'm really proud of is that we're trying to help people who are incarcerated people get access to education, access to information. They don't have some of the same benefits or opportunities other people do. And so I'd say, look for people who are vulnerable. There are so many groups, whatever they are, it could be a race, equity, geographic diversity, people who are out in rural areas who may not have access to the internet, who may not have access to lawyers, they didn't grow up around any, things like that. Or find people like that and really, they need the most help and try to help those people if you can. Great, I just got a message from Mac that maybe she's having some issues. Uh, Mac, are you there? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and voice um, the first uh, student question then. And then uh, this is for whichever panelist wants to answer it. So you don't all have to answer it. So you can just sort of um, you know jump in there. Um, and that question is, what specific changes need to be made to our judicial system to better ensure the rule of law? I don't There's know if I should or shouldn't answer that. I'm going to go last, definitely, so that I can hear the answers and then immediately <laughs> adopt those. So I'm going to go last. Okay. Please, and I'll ahead. repeat it since you haven't seen it. The question was, what specific changes need to be made to our judicial system to better ensure rule of law? I'll just say very briefly uh, and then pass it on uh, that, uh, you know, I, I think something that we, we've been talking about, you know, the judicial system could use a lot more different voices. I think, again, for me, the rule of law is about ensuring that the law applies equally to everyone. And the best way to ensure that is to make sure that everyone is participating in the judicial system. Um, you know, I am still in the courtroom too often where I am the only woman um, who is up there arguing. Um, and uh, the, the representation of people of color is even more shockingly um, uh, minimal. So I, I think that would be a wonderful improvement to the judicial system uh, in terms of the rule of law. 
So I'm happy to jump in next, and I'm not going to give you my full uh, ammo on this one, but just I'll give a couple of highlights. And I will say I'm saying all of this in my personal capacity. This doesn't reflect the ABA's uh, views. First, I would do away with judicial elections. Uh, judges uh, should not be elected in a popularity contest because they just represent, you know, spe special interest or the majority interests. Uh, judges are selected so that they will be ind independent arbiters of facts and law, and they should be selected on, you know, objective criteria that are applied evenly in their selection process. And the United States is one of the last uh, developed democracies that has widespread judicial elections across this country. And I think it really um, politicizes the judiciary in a terrible way and needs to stop. And uh, that, that would probably be my number one bit bugaboo for the U.S. I, no, no, please judge. No, I, I probably have nothing more to offer that you could. Thank no, you. I just wanted to um, echo Colleen. I think it's super important. I really hope what you listen to what Colleen said. I never thought I would be uh, certainly a Department of Justice prosecutor uh, when I went, and, and it was really fun, actually. Uh, sometimes when we went, it was actually, I, got, I was very lucky. I got to do a lot of uh, uh, travel internationally. And when I got to introduce myself and say, I'm Zia Faruqi, and I represent the United States Department of Justice. And they're like, that's not the face we thought we were going to see. That's not the personality we thought we were going to see. All these things. It made me so proud because I wanted to say to them, yes, this is what America is. It is the child of immigrants. A, uh, for much of my life, unfortunately, a single mom because my father passed away. You know, middle income, like we were nobody special. And that's what is, makes America special in my mind. And so it was so empowering and gave me such energy to keep moving because you hear people like, wow, that, that is who you are. And so I would just encourage you all, think about becoming lawyers, think about joining the court system. You know, one of the things Rebecca always reminds students is you don't have to be a lawyer. We have accountants here, we have HR people, we have business people who are running the courthouse. If the electricity doesn't come on, um, as anyone tells you on judges, we are very sensitive. And so we like our air conditioning, we like our nice cafeteria, we like all these things, our internet work, if it doesn't work, we panic. And so there is a symphony here. And surely, yes, the conductor gets a lot of attention, but you have to believe in the mission, which is part of all of us working together. And we need people, as Colleen said, let's be very clear, from distinct and diverse backgrounds. That means, again, it doesn't just have to be gender, race, culture, it's, it's immigration status, it's uh, your diversity of ideas, all of these things, we need you here so that the fabric is richer and people are getting different viewpoints. That's why I love to do the podcast and interview diverse judges. And it's not about the law. It's just about hearing who they are and how they're just people from di different backgrounds. I interviewed a judge from uh, the Michigan State Court who um, was told she should never go to college. She thought she was going to get married and have kids. And she's like, that's great. I actually have a lot of my friends do that. I'm so proud of them. She's like, I just didn't even realize that's not what I want to do. And I just was lucky and met some mentors and I never would have thought that I would become a judge. And, and now she has. And so you don't realize the value that you can bring to the judiciary, to the legal system, just from being you. And so I hope you'll listen to Colleen. Think about becoming a law clerk, a law student. Uh, Kathy can provide my information offline. Happy to talk to anyone about it. But we need you to help diversify the judiciary. I guess I'll just add one example of and that I think pulls in how important it is and why diversifying ju the judiciary is important one y'all gotta be lawyers if you want to be a judge right <laughs> to do that well you know we and so we do need diverse lawyers but when I was working in the King County Prosecutor's Office um, in, a, in a district court case, which are low level cases, you know, misdemeanor cases, I had, um, there's somebody that, you know, was, I can't even remember what he was being charged with, but he didn't understand English. He didn't understand Spanish. He's from Mexico. He didn't understand because he was indigenous. And so he had a few words that, you know, some, some, some capture of language um, in Spanish. And the judge in that case said, a Spanish interpreter isn't enough. And I was out of my mind to say, what? <laughs> it's hard to understand what's going on in English, right? In my own language, much, much less a, a language you barely understand. And so it, it's really important to have that perspective in that 
very critical, very powerful place where a lot of discretion, when I talk about discretion, you know, the judges gets to make that, those decisions, um, impact everyday lives, everyday things, right? And so it is important. I just wanted to give like a very concrete example of the power a judge holds in, in everyday life. Okay, so we're gonna move on to question two, which is to Ms. Sinzak. Um, how has the expansion of presidential pardon power impacted the rule of law in the United States? So this is a really great question. Whoever asked it as I was getting ready this morning, I thought, oh, I really hope that I don't have to talk about when exceptions to the rule of law are good because it's very confusing and I'm still wrapping my head around it. So of course this question gets to the heart of that. Um, so I used to be uh, an English teacher. So you're gonna have to forgive me for saying that um, I think about Shakespeare when I think about the pardon power because many, maybe some of you have read um, Oh boy, let's pretend I remember the name of the case, but the quality of mercy is not strained. <laughs> um, Merchant of Venice, I think. Um, and, you know, I think the pardon power is, is, is about mercy. And I think there is any good system of law involves mercy and um, involves admitting that sometimes um, the judicial system makes mistakes. And I think the pardon power was designed to leave room for that, to say, you know, sometimes uh, people will be convicted and that will not be correct. And we want there to be a way to fix that. Um, and sometimes even someone will be con convicted, but there may be very powerful reasons to exercise mercy. So I wanna stress that I personally, and again, I'm not speaking for the federal government, but I personally think that the pardon power is very important. But as I think this question is getting at, it can be abused. As soon as you, as, as I was saying a couple of answers ago, as soon as you start making exceptions, um, it gets harder and harder to enforce the rule. And so once, and, 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 and you need mercy, you need to be able to recognize that you make mistakes, but you need that to be a very, a, a rarity. You need that to be, um, the pardon power to be used uh, in, in, in few circumstances so that um, it doesn't become kind of a free for all and it doesn't start to undermine some of the other things like a president who um, is uh, giving um, pardons to his best friends is doing exactly what I said, um, uh, it undermines the rule of law. It's saying, well, the law doesn't apply to the people I like. It's saying no one in my class can um, use a cell phone except Jane, because I love Jane, so she gets to do it. Um, and, and as soon as that starts to happen, there's the, you know, the, as you all know, if you see a teacher who's making exceptions for their favorite students, you're gonna lose some respect for that teacher. And if our government starts making um, exceptions for the people they like, people are gonna lose respect for the government. So um, I, I think it's tough though. I think if I was president, uh, which well, sadly not probably never happened, but if I were, I think that it would keep me up at night deciding how to use the pardon power. I'll add in real quick. First of all, I'm voting for Colleen, President Colleen. We've got Judge Mag, we got President Colleen. Everyone's getting a promotion on this panel. Uh, but um, I want to draw what she actually said before, which is that um, nothing can have exceptions, right? And I think the, the pardon power is in the Constitution as it is, right? And it's, it's cast broadly uh, and clearly. And so it wouldn't be fair if it wasn't there, and then a president started just saying what she said, like, oh, my friend just um, stole his car, and so I'm gonna let them out. I think the framers had a different idea. They were like, look, people, because of just and mercy, for instance, the current uh, pardon attorney, so there's a presidentially appointed pardon attorney, she's a former public defender. Uh, and so there is, uh, I think the underpinnings of that are compassion, but it's also because what is such important part of rule of law? no secrets, right? Cards uh, face up. And, and so if, if a president was letting someone out and hooking them up from behind the scenes, that's not okay. But this is open and out there. And I will tell you, I worked in an office that prosecuted a case uh, when I was a prosecutor, the Blackwater investigation, and someone was pardoned out of it. And I found the case to be profoundly important to me as a Muslim American. This is, I do believe, again, and, and, and I'm sorry if I'm a broken record, but I do believe it. And I'm going to do it on Constitution Day. Uh, just like it's okay to sing Christmas carols on Christmas Day, they're not cheesy then. I believe that America is amazing. I think this is one of the only countries in the world where we prosecuted U.S. persons in a foreign country who uh, allegedly killed civilians from a different country. So Americans killed foreigners who from a different religion in a war zone, 
we prosecuted the Americans. I don't know if any other country does that in the world. I'm not sure. I just know mine does. And I'm so proud of them for it. And so whatever happened at the end, who was pardoned, that doesn't matter because the Department of Justice did the right thing at that time. And then the president had the right to do that too. And that's also okay because that's our system, but nothing was secret. Everything was in the open. And so I think that some people, uh, and I think Colleen is, you know, her comments and the students, some people are uncomfortable now. They're worried that maybe there isn't a limit on this. But that's the great thing. We're talking about this openly and candidly. Scott has already challenged you, uh, as have the other panelists, get involved. And if you think this is too broad, the Constitution has changed. It happens. We've done it before. And, and, and things that were seemingly much more difficult, right? Like th this country found ways to make new uh, amendments to the Constitution to try to ensure equity for people uh, who were slaves. And so if you think the presidential pardon power has run out of whack, make this your cause and find ways you can change it. So, but it's not in secret. And I think that's what matters. Okay, so our next question is open to anyone and it is how can kids support rule of law? Although I'm gonna challenge you to make it about one sentence because we have about three minutes to answer this question for all of us. <laughs> I would say real quickly, learn the rules you operate in and question every instance when you do not see those rules applied fairly and evenly. We're all agreeing with that, yeah. Okay, then maybe we have time for one um, more question that is a super um, current event question. And so we'll just let one person answer it, whoever feels like they have a short, great answer to it. And that is, what does a special master do? I'll take that one. Uh, I'm going to appoint a special master in one of my cases uh, that's totally unrelated. It's about um, people who are the victims of terrorism and maybe considering whether that they, how much of the damages they can get. And so, um, I'm a huge Star Wars fan, so obviously I was just excited because I thought we could somehow weave into my opinion, and I have before made multiple Star Wars references, and so uh, I'm giving you all a spoiler alert. It's going to happen here. We'll find a way, but a special master, uh, at least in my case, in my understanding, and it's different in each one, it's someone who's an expert who you're trying to bring in to assist the judge as, what do we talk about this entire call? Being neutral, being fair, being impartial, right? The prosecutor's job is to uh, defend the rights of the public. Uh, and to move advanced interest of the government. The defense lawyer's job is to be a, a fight so hard for their client. And sometimes a judge is like, well, I need someone to be on my team. And so I think that's a special master. Someone who's going to come in and assist the judge, but also be re removed from the judge because sometimes the judge doesn't want to know something. So like in some cases, there are things like uh, the, the conversation between a lawyer and their client that's secret. And I can't know what that is because it might bias me. Uh, and so I don't want to know that. And certainly the two other sides, only one can know that. And so a special master is when you kind of tap someone in from the sideline uh, to come in and say, I need some help. Uh, can you help go through this and be neutral and impartial and fair and assist the court in making sure that the rule of law is uh, fairly applied? Uh, and it's, you know, someone to help the judge. And Judge Perky, I probably um, should have asked you to do this beforehand, but can you, maybe for those who don't know why that question was asked and why it is such a current events question, could you just give us a 30 second background on why that question comes up today as um, super relevant? Yeah, I, either people are really aware of my docket, which I'm so happy to hear, um, or it could be because of the international news story that was last night, which was that uh, when former President Trump's house was subject to a search warrant, so a magistrate judge, one of my colleagues uh, in Florida, uh, uh, issued a warrant after a law enforcement agent made a sworn statement of probable cause. When they went in and searched uh, former president's residence, there's classified material that was allegedly there and allegedly some attorney client secret conversations. And the concern is that if something is so important and secret that the side that's prosecuting the people, they shouldn't be able to look at it first. There should be someone that's neutral and fair that gets a first cut to say, look, this is secret. You can't look at it. Even though it's something that could be helpful to your case, it's not appropriate. And so what a special, you know, that's, it's not only happens that case. It does happen, like I said, in my case, I know of other cases when sometimes a law firm is searched, special masters are appointed because you need somebody potentially that can go through and do a first kind of first review and say, this stuff is secret, this stuff is not, it is privileged, not secret like we want to hide it, but it's just, 
it's protected by law, really. So don't confuse secret with like, we're trying to hide something, but the special master uh, in this, this district judge uh, has ordered a special master be appointed that the both parties actually agreed upon who that person was. Like, isn't that nice to see when people and litigants, we can agree. Please, for all of you become lawyers, learn. You don't have to always argue with the other side. Sometimes you actually can agree with them. It makes things move faster, uh, but they agreed to a person to make a first review of the documents. Now they may still argue about whether or not that person should be there, but they have agreed for that review of the uh, former president's records, a third party special master will review it. Great. Well, sadly, we are out of time. So I want to thank a lot of people. I want to start by thanking um, the students who had great questions. As always, I'm frustrated, as I'm sure you are, that we didn't get to all of them. Um, but there were some fantastic questions. And for the teachers for bringing us into your classrooms. I want to thank Mac for being our student moderator. It was great to hear a student voice. Of course, I want to thank our esteemed panelists um, for taking the time to do this. Um, we really appreciate you lending your expertise for all corners of the legal um, sphere. And uh, of course, we want to thank the Annenberg Center for funding of the lessons that are available free and online teachers and uh, for funding this uh, for this expert panel. So thank you all so much for coming and there should be a recording available shortly.